you. Hope you all have been well. Hi. Hey. Hello. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everyone who's watching. Okay. I have so many notes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Great. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Veronica Roth in conversation with Charlie Jane Anders. My name is Jamie Madsen, and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfield's Books, and I'll also be your host for the evening. Copperfield Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. We're thrilled to be offering free online events during these times to keep our community connected while we're all forced to be separated. As COVID-19 continues to endanger the future of independent bookstores like us, you can show your support for Copperfields and help keep us alive by purchasing a book through our online store. We thank you for your continued support. So just a couple of house cleaning items before I introduce tonight's authors. We will be utilizing the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, links for purchasing both Veronica and Charlie's latest books, as well as their previous award-winning titles, and we'll also include my contact details for post-event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to with any questions or comments for the authors. The format for tonight's event will feature 30 to 45 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a live Q&A. We will try to get to as many of your questions as we can, as your feedback is welcomed and appreciated. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my posts in the chat box as this will be more convenient for the Q&A. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce our speakers for the evening. Veronica Roth is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Divergent series, as well as the Carve the Mark duology. Divergent received the 2011 Goodreads Choice Award for Favorite Book, Publishers Weekly Best Book of 2011, and was the winner of the Yalsa 2012 Teens Top 10. Carve the Mark, published in January 2017, debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list and remained on the list for 18 weeks to follow. The Fates Divide, the second installment of the Carve the Mark series, also debuted at number one at the, on the New York Times bestseller list. In elementary school, Veronica read constantly, but it wasn't until she got a make your own book kit from her mother as a gift that she thought to write anything of her own. From that time on, she knew she would write for the rest of her life, whether she was published or not. Today, she is a board member of the Y'all Fest, the biggest YA book festival in the country, and Y'all West, its sister festival. She currently lives in Chicago with her husband and their dog, Avi, whose adorable existence is well documented on Instagram. Joining her tonight is Charlie Jane Anders. Charlie is the former editor-in-chief of io9, the popular Gawker media site devoted to science fiction and fantasy. Her debut novel, All the Birds in the Sky, won the Nebula, Locus, and Crawford Awards and was on Time's list of the 10 best novels of 2016. Her award-winning short fiction, including Six Months, Three Days, has appeared on Tor.com, as well as Wired, Slate, Tin House, Conjunctions, Boston Review, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, ZYZZYVA, and several anthologies. Anders is also known for her journalism and activism. She organizes the popular Writers with Drink series and has written for Salon, The Wall Street Journal, Mother Jones, and many other outlets. Tonight, these two notable writers of science fiction and fantasy will be discussing the thought-provoking topic, Kill Your Darlings, Why Writers Imperil Their Heroes. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Charlie. Hey, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm so excited to chat with y'all. This is going to be such a fun 
I love this topic and I'm, I love Veronica's new book, Chosen Ones, which if you haven't gotten it yet, you all have to run out and get it immediately. Get it from Copperfields. They have it on their website. You can totally get a copy right now and it'll probably be there pretty soon. It's such a great book. And um, yeah, I'm just so excited to talk about this topic. But first of all, I just wanted to really kind of emphasize that this is a really hard time for independent bookstores. Uh, independent bookstores are the lifeblood of our book lover communities, but they're also the lifeblood of our local communities. They are, by definition, the local places that we go to gather to geek out about books and to discover new books and to hang out with booksellers, which, who are the honestly the coolest people I've ever met in my entire life. And, you know, a neighborhood without a bookstore is just kind of a sad place. And, you know, I feel like most of my happiest times in my life have been spent in bookstores. And I just really want to make sure that they're there for us when this is all over. And, you know, bookstores, the last thing I want to say about them is that they have a they have like high rents, especially in the Bay Area. They have really low margins. They sell a product that they cannot raise the price of. Like the price of a book is printed on the, the book cover. And it's just really hard. They're, they're really financially strapped right now. And everything you can do to support local bookstores is so important. And please, please, please just buy all the books from Cropper Fields tonight. Not just my books and Veronica's books, but any book that you've thinking, been thinking about buying. There's so many great books out right now. And Cropper Fields has all of them. And they're such a great store. And they really deserve your support. So I'm really excited to geek out about like, you know, torturing our characters and killing our darlings and murdering <laughs> and slaughtering and, you know, destroying. And this is something I think about a lot because, you know, I always used to think that I was too easy on my characters and that I just, you know, that I didn't hurt them enough because I tend to like, I tend to over identify with my characters and I tend to just want to things to go really easily for them and be like, Oh yeah. And then there's this problem, but it's, it turns out to be just a misunderstanding. And then, Oh yeah, this guy's trying to kill them, but he actually isn't trying to kill them and it's fine. And like, you know, one of my failure modes as a writer, I always used to think was that I was too easy on my characters, but I've discovered that that's actually not true and that people get really mad at me for being so sadistic to my characters. And I've actually gotten like people like, standing up at book events back when we did book events in person and being like, how could you do this to this character? How, why would you do that? That's so mean. And I'm so shocking you know, to me. I mean, it's not, it's not that you're not, you're like nice to them, but I just never thought of you as like, Oh wow, Charlie. Cruel. I know. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I'm actually, I try to be really mindful about what I do to my characters. And I think that, you know, it's, I mean, I like to torture my characters psychologically, I think, which is the thing that I sort of think, oh, it's just psychological torture. It's not like actual torture, but oh, people you. get really upset. And like, you know, All the Birds in the Sky, my kind of big debut novel, has uh, these two characters who have kind of a terrible childhood. And then they grow up and their lives are actually kind of better once they're not kids anymore. But they still are scarred by this terrible childhood they had. And that's something that I kind of wanted to explore in that book. And I was... There were so many things in that book that I thought people were going to be upset by, but I had no idea that so many people were going to be like, how could you have like inflicted this terrible childhood on these characters? That's just so cruel. And my second book with Tor that came out like in 2019, The City in the Middle of the Night, you know, I have this character Mouth who is kind of a selfish jerk at times and people get really mad at her and are kind of giving her, her a hard time for some of the choices she's made. And people were coming up to book events and being like, why is everybody so mean to Mouth? Why is everybody so hurtful to her? And Mouth does go through a lot of stuff. There is people get injured. People like get killed. I do love killing off characters, especially in like the most shocking, bizarre way. Like in, you know, the city in the middle of the night, there's a character who's just in the middle of a conversation and then a monster just charges out of the darkness and rips them in half and just runs away. And it's like, oh, that just happened. And sorry, that was a spoiler, but I do love doing that. And I, I, I like to kill off a character if it's going to really have some oomph to it. And I've actually been talked down from like, maybe instead of killing five characters here, you just kill one, but make it really bad. And I'm like, okay, I guess. So I don't know. I think, I think for me, psychological ter torture is something that I really enjoy doing, but I would love to hear more about what your feel thoughts are about like, different kinds of torture and murdering your characters versus just tormenting them, Veronica. I would love to oh, hear you. Because, 
Yeah, I feel like you're really good at this. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so to me, um, especially with Divergent, it was kind of a priority because how dystopic is a society exactly if everybody survives and everything is fine? Um, doesn't sound so bad, right? So in order for a story to have impact and to have tension, I think you have to be willing to make sacrifices. Um, so for me, I mean, I like grew up on kind of TV and, and books and movies that did this. So I think for me, it felt very natural. And I am in the same camp as you in that I think the psychological stuff is much worse in a lot of ways than um, like having to live with pain seems to me to be a much more profound way of kind of torturing a character than um, when they die. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, I was talking to a friend earlier about this because she said that uh, she got angry at the end of Phenomenon, which was a movie with John Travolta that came out when I was a child. Um, and he dies at the end. Sorry to spoil it. But no! <laughs> no! No, I know. Who saw it coming, right? Um, but anyway, she remembers being like outraged by this death. And I don't remember feeling that way at all. I remember being sad. But I remember thinking like that was the story that was supposed to be told. And I think that's been my attitude since then is that um, when you love a character, you want them to have a powerful story. And one of the ways to do that, though certainly not the only way, um, is to have loss uh, involved. So that's kind of my perspective on it. I've since become less of a character killer <laughs> <laughs> and a little more of like a, it's like a more delving into the psychology. Um, pro probably because, you know, I had <laughs> people reacted to <laughs> some of the choices I made in a really intense way. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, f I feel like in YA, especially YA from like, you know, like I feel like you need there to be some consequences. There need to be people dying or things happening that are like really scary and upsetting or it doesn't feel like it's like a real adventure kind of, or it doesn't feel like there's stakes. I feel like it's about stakes, right? It's about like, you know, if nothing bad ever happens, then the stakes can't be that high, really. Yeah, and I, um, gosh, it's kind of like hard to talk about Harry Potter right now, but I will because I grew up on it. Um, but uh, I remember really believing that like anyone could be next <laughs> when I was reading that series. And it, it, it made it, um, it made like Harry's quest for victory much more urgent and important because it was like actual things are at stake here and this person needs to be taken down. Otherwise like really terrible things will happen. So um, I think without those losses, it wouldn't have meant as much. And that really like made an impact on me, I think growing up with those books coming out while I was getting progressively older. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of wondering while I was thinking about this, what the uh, devastating character moments of your youth were, because <laughs> I think they're formative. Wow, I mean, gosh. I mean, I was a huge Doctor Who fan growing up and I remember vividly when they killed they killed off Adric who was this incredibly terrible annoying companion on Doctor Who I don't know if you ever watched Doctor Who it was it was a huge part of my childhood and this one supporting character who traveled around with the doctor in this time machine was this twerpy know-it-all kid who literally wore a gold star to show that he was the smartest. Like he literally like they were like how can we show that this kid is like the smartest and that he knows he's the smartest. Oh let's give him an actual gold star. And like, there's actually a plot point in the story where he's killed off. It's, I mean, sorry, the spoilers all around, but it's like from 30 years ago. So whatever. I think we're good. Um, <laughs> there's actually like a plot point where they're like, you know, oh, his star is made of gold so he could use it against these aliens that are allergic to gold. So they really drive it home that his gold star is actually made of real gold. And then they kill him. And they're like, he kills, he gets killed in this really stupid pointless way where he's trying to save the world but it turns out that if he hadn't done anything he could have lived with the and the world would have been fine he just sacrificed his life for no reason and then everybody's just like whoa and then 
that that episode they ran the credits in silence over like a black background to show that this was really and they showed pieces of his broken gold star at the bottom of the screen as the credits rolled in black otherwise blackness and it was like the gold star has been destroyed it was like so heavy-handed but as a little kid i was like they they killed the annoying trippy kid and like that means nobody's safe and like that had a huge impact on me for sure Mm-hmm. For sure. And then Tasha Yar also. Fucking Tasha Yar. Sorry, frickin' Tasha Yar. They killed Tasha Yar. I mean, that was that was kind of intense. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, she has a little memorial that she gives to Data or whatever. I don't know. It was a thing. But, yeah, I mean, but I think that, you know, I think that psychological torture, yes, is like, it's, if there's something that, you know, you get to, I think that in general, when bad things happen, it's more interesting if you can see the ramifications of it. Like if you can see how it affects people afterwards. Like um, I was talking to Josh Friedman who created one of my favorite TV shows of all time, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, Terminator of the Sarah Connor Chronicles. And he wrote, he was talking about this one episode of the show where there was some character who was killed off in a previous episode. And Josh was like, we're going to have an episode where they go to this person's funeral. We don't really even know this character that well, but we're going to go to their funeral because I feel like if somebody, if we're going to kill someone, we should go to their funeral. And I was like, wow, that's such, I mean, I don't think that's, yeah, I don't think it's literally true that anytime you kill off a character, you have to go to their funeral because in some cases that would be a lot of funerals, like depending on the series. But I think that the idea that their death has to be felt and that you have to actually like process it in some way it's something that's really stuck with me from, from Josh saying that. And I don't know. What do you think about that? Do you think that, like, at least metaphorically? Yeah, I think the aftermath is important. And partly, I think stories are a way that we play out uh, real life kind of trauma, right? Like, um, I haven't had someone very close to me die, fortunately. But, um, and I think I'm terrified of it. So I... So I sometimes appreciate getting to see characters endure it because it's a way of telling myself that like it can be endured, right? Like we can be resilient and move past these moments. Um, and so it's almost like playing dress up with, um, I don't know, with these things that we will all encounter. Like they, it is inevitable that you will lose people you love in your life. And, um, and experiencing those emotions on like a smaller scale, I think can partly prepare us for what they'll be like, and at least teach us that we can that we can make it through those things. So showing the aftermath is important, right? Because then you're like, okay, well, really life does go on even if it's sad. Um, right, no, for sure. Yeah, I read you write something, you were, you're writing like a nonfiction book about writing on tour, right? On tour. Yeah, that's yeah. right. What's it, what is it called again? Just so people can- It's called, yeah, it's called Never Say You Can't Survive, which is the title of uh, one of my favorite albums of all time. It's an album by Curtis Mayfield. And so basically I'm doing like a weekly column over at tour.com about how to use writing to get through scary, hard times. And it's something I've, I've been working on it for a couple of years now. And it just happened to start running like, you know, a few weeks ago at the height of like this- current situation and the timing seems pretty good because i think people need an outlet right now and i think writing is a really good creative outlet and actually the thing you said about like kind of when you read about or write about someone surviving something really scary and upsetting and awful in fiction it kind of helps you to imagine how you would survive something like that in real life and i think that that's actually super powerful and really important and I think that that can be really helpful. And it's definitely helped me to like put myself in the shoes, either as a reader or as a writer in a character who is dealing with something really scary and intense. Yeah. I, I always feel like, um, I don't know if it doesn't impact you at all. Like if you don't have an emotional reaction to it, then someone did something wrong. <laughs> like it shouldn't, right. I mean, it shouldn't be gratuitous and it, and it shouldn't feel like nothing. Like I, I think there are some TV shows I don't want to like shade any TV shows, but the Vampire Diaries, where people oh, die. I love Vampire Diaries. No, I totally love it. But people, but but now when or like later in the show when people died, I was always like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like I didn't have the same emotional reaction to it because I was like, they'll probably be back <laughs> in some way or another. True. Um, I so. mean, that one time they killed off Tyler Lockwood, and it was clearly just to give Damon like another moment of being really bad and like Damon hadn't done anything bad in a while 
And Tyler Lockwood hadn't even been on the show for like a year or two. And they literally just brought him back to kill him. And he shows up for like five minutes and is like, hey, it's me, Tyler. Remember me? Oh, shit, I'm dead. And like, you know. Why? And then, and then <laughs> after like half an episode, nobody even remembers that he died. And it's like, okay, so Tyler wasn't exactly my favorite character, but I did feel like he got a little bit shortchanged there. He got a little shafted. It's true. Yeah. I mean... You know, I loved on Vampire... Sorry, I can talk about Vampire Diaries for the next, like, three hours. <laughs> I did love the one time when, like, Damon kills Jeremy, like, Elena's sister, and then he's fine. He's a moment. Running. Yeah, and then you're like, okay, well, they swept that under the rug, and then, like, two seasons later, Elena gets, like, brainwashed to forget some of her time with Damon, and suddenly the fact that Damon killed Jeremy is, like, this huge big deal in her mind. And it's like, okay, so they actually are going to deal with this on like an ongoing basis, even though Jeremy's fine, because... Yeah. Well, everyone has... processes grief in an extremely expedited way on that show, by necessity. I mean... Right. Don't get me wrong. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> but... I love that show, but it's... it's. I just saw a headline like an hour or two ago that like the two stars that show, like Paul Wesley and uh, Ian Summerhalder, are like for, starting their own bourbon company. And I'm like... That's, they know what that show was about. They that do. Show, <laughs> oh my God, I forgot. They're always drinking on that show. Everybody's, Vampire Diaries makes so much more sense if you just assume everybody's kind of wasted the entire time. Yes. Just like, because they just always have like a full glass of whiskey in their hands. My and they're hands. terrible decisions and horrible shit happens and they just shrug it off because they're drunk. And yeah. they're just like, whatever, I'm wasted. It makes perfect sense. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question, which is just in general, like, are there kinds of trauma or kinds of, you know, bad stuff you can do to characters that are not necessarily off limits, but you have to be more careful. And I'm speaking specifically about like, I don't know, sexual assault, you know, other kinds of abuse, things that leave people disabled, you know, uh, this is something I've really struggled with a lot in my writing because like, for example, in the city in the middle of the night, I had a, a thing where one of the characters has a near, like, they, 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 somebody tries to sexually assault them and then is thwarted at the last minute. And I still decided to take that out because I was like, if I'm going to put this in, I really have to do justice to, uh, what, do, you, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I mean, the main thought I have about it is that um, I kind of had to, like, grow up in front of people through the Divergent books in a lot of ways and become more aware of the world after I had written them. So there's a lot of things in those books that I feel not so great about. Um, like there's kind of an attempted assault on Triss that's unexamined. And there's a couple other things that I just feel were not handled with the thoughtfulness that I wish they would they were now. Um, and what's become important to me about that now is to acknowledge that whenever I can. So here it is, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that I'm not into. Um, because I think it's important to acknowledge that, like, you can, you will always have things in your book that you didn't handle as well as you'd like, um, and you do learn from them, and the important thing is to, you know, keep learning and growing, but now I handle that stuff a little more carefully, a lot more carefully <laughs> than in the past, um, <clears throat> and I think a lot about that in terms of just doing research and making sure that things do have an emotional impact, that they're not, like, there for no reason and that they're kind of central to the story you're trying to tell which I think is something that you do a really good job at like it's never something that just gets like swept under the rug like no big deal it's an ongoing part of each character's processing and um that was also something I tried to do in Chosen Ones with Sloane she has this traumatic event that we don't get to look at super closely um in her past and that's like the whole novel is her dealing with it so I think it's like it's okay to, you have to be able to write about things that you haven't yourself experienced or that, um, I don't know, or that are hard or challenging for people to read about um, in your work because that's what's in the world, right? But um, I think it's pretty important to treat them even though you're in a fantasy world, like they are real, so. Right, yeah, and I, I mean, with The City in the Middle of the Night, I definitely, I spent so much time kind of work, trying to, do justice to that, like talking to friends who've dealt with really intense trauma, uh, reading books about trauma. Uh, this one book that a friend of mine who's a therapist recommended to me is called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how we carry trauma in our bodies 
not just in our minds, but like we actually have it in our bodies. And I really tried to think about that writing this one character, Sophie, in in, in the city in the middle of the night. But that was actually my next question to you is like, like I love the fact that in Chosen Ones, I love that Sloan is carrying a lot of like, she's carrying a lot of trauma and she's also just got like a lot of kind of baggage from having gone through this like, you know, adventure when she was younger. And I love yeah. the kind of detail <laughs> of like the, the, the way that you invest things with symbolism, like the boots, like her boots are like this huge thing. And, you know, I love that she's a character who kind of comes across at first as like a little bit kind of almost like callous, but then you kind of go get into her POV and you kind of realize what's actually going on. And how did you do that? How did you kind of come up with that? And what did, where did that come from in terms of like, and did, did the character come first and then the backstory or did you have the backstory in your head when you started writing her? You know, I think it was kind of baked into the concept of the book in that, um, you know, I wanted to have fun with kind of the chosen one trope, but I also right. wanted to take it seriously because that's something that I enjoy doing. Um, and I figured anyone who has to defeat a dark lord when they're a teenager would have some like significant issues after that point. Because mm -hmm. first of all, you become like, in absurdly famous, which is not something that's good for anyone's brain. Um, and also you're famous for murdering a man. Um, he might deserve it, but you still killed him, which is a lot to bear. Um, and then Sloane has some other stuff going on too with magic and with, she is kidnapped by the Dark One uh, prior to the start of the novel, you know, 10 years before. And she's still dealing with that too. So um, I kind of feel like it, the backstory came from what I wanted to explore in the book, which was just kind of the psychological impact of entrusting young people with these intense <laughs> burdens. Like, what are we doing exactly <laughs> in these books? You know, um, like Paul Atreides is 16 when they like throw him out into the desert and they're like, oh, man. you're our Kwisatz Haderach, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I mean, I think that's kind of insane, but it's also something that we kind of do, we kind of, let our young people carry a lot of a lot of weight so um so yeah i guess it's chicken or egg style it was kind of concept based right and she kind of proceeded naturally from that i was like what kind of character do i want to tell this story like i wanted her to not really be that heroic um she's kind of an anti-hero which when i was young there weren't a lot of like lady anti-heroes in the world and now there are more thankfully um but I always wanted to write one, you know, um, kind of a reluctant hero, like out, outlaw type, which is sort of what she starts off as at least. And then she becomes more vulnerable as time goes yeah. on. Yeah. And that's part of what I love about the book is the vulnerability that kind of comes out of her, like over the course of the book and like, you know, the way that it kind of slowly kind of unfolds into a romance. I don't want to get into like major spoilers, but I really thought that that was so beautifully done. And I just really loved the shape of it. And I don't know, I don't have really have a question, but I just, I thought that that was just a really, I liked that journey. I thought that that was a, it started off as it's, I like books that kind of start off and you think, you know, it's what it's going to be. And then it kind of keeps surprising you, mm -hmm. which I thought you did beautifully in Chosen Ones. Well, thank you. Um, I had a question for you, which is um, sort of related. Have you, do you think you've ever regretted a choice that you made um, after writing a book to like let a character suffer? Or do you always feel like it was necessary and no matter what the reaction is, like it was on purpose and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's actually an interesting, there's, it's kind of, there's like, I mentioned before about all the birds of the sky and how those, the kids have a really, like I kind of went all rolled doll a little bit on their, the kids in their childhood and kind of gave them like, like a classic English fantasy kind of feel where you were like, uh, Ooh, like they're in the orphanage with the porridge. And, but I, I kind of liked bit. that about it. <laughs> I kind of went, I was just like, a, you know, I feel like childhood is just this weird, scary time when nothing makes any freaking sense and people are just imposing weird rules on you and it's just kind of messed up and I wanted to capture that and also I just you know I grew up reading a lot of Roald Dahl that kind of stuff and I love that kind of like weird like adults are monsters kind of thing and I felt like it it was fun to then explore how that shaped them as adults but you know but also I had a novel which was never published and I'm kind of grateful for that now which I had an urban fantasy novel which I wrote um like seven or eight years ago, I guess, before All the Birds in the Sky. And I'm trying to revise it now. And I'm like, 
maybe turn it into a novella or something. And I'm like, wow, I'm glad this wasn't published because I was trying to do like the noir kind of urban fantasy thing. And I think that I let the noir tropes kind of um, push me around a little bit too much because it gets a little bit too, the main female character is a little too damsel in distress. The main male character is kind of your hard boiled kind of detective-y character. It's like very, you know, Raymond Chandler, Mickey Spillane, that kind of noir stuff. But it, it just felt like it didn't quite give the female character enough agency. And it also just felt like she was kind of, she didn't get to be the hero of her own story, I guess. And I'm going back and looking at it now and being like, yeah, I'm really glad that this didn't, because she kind of gets some really bad stuff happens to her. And it doesn't feel like she gets to be in control of her situation as much as I feel like she should be with the amount of bad stuff that was happening to her. And it's, it's a whole thing. It's like, it would be too long to get into. And luckily nobody's going to read that version of the book ever, but I was kind of shocked when I went back to it. Yeah. So, I, I have you know. some of those where I'm like, Oh, well, Whoa. <laughs> it's really good. Nobody published this. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, it's funny because I'm writing this thing that, like you mentioned, I'm writing this thing for Tor about how to use writing to get through hard times. And I'm one of the essays I'm working on right now is about tropes and how tropes are awesome. I love tropes. Tropes are great. But you can't let tropes kind of like push you around. You can't let be like, well, I'm writing, you know, a noir kind of detective-y story. Therefore, there has to be a, a femme fatale or there has to be a damsel in distress or there has to be like, you know, you get to decide what of the tropes you're going to use and what you're not going to not use. And actually, that's something I would love to hear your thoughts about. Like, are there things where you're like, well, this is the trope but I'm not going to do that because that's messed up or I'm going to do it, but I'm going to make it slightly different. Like, I feel like Chosen One's plays with tropes in a really interesting way, which is part of what I loved about it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I thought about it. Um, I thought about it, especially with like not having a singular Chosen One with the kind of like makeup of the group of, there's five of them, you know, so um, how they kind of divide that responsibility and, um, and gosh, what else? I mean, just the whole notion of a chosen one is sort of like a, an extremely Western um, kind of concept. So I thought about that a lot because we're just a hyper individualist kind of culture and we love like a solitary hero, but that's not really how the world works, right? We need each other to survive. So um, yeah, and uh, then just that hero narrative in general, in terms of like trying to make it more complicated and she's not, I don't know, like I don't, even know how to classify her. I don't want to give away the ending, but I wouldn't say that she's straightforwardly heroic. I think she has a moment where she wonders if the world is even worth saving. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I've had that thought once or twice <laughs> recently. <laughs> Not in only in like a general, like kind of cavalier way, but um, sometimes the world seems like a really broken place. And you're kind of like, well, <laughs> what can we even do here? Um, and I think Sloan had, you know, that attitude to a uh, kind of exaggerated degree. Um, so her grappling with her chosenness and the kind of like unfair burden of it. And I think she asks at one point, like, where were you guys? Why didn't you charge in to try and do something? Um, like, why are we just waiting for us to do it? And that's like a thing I say to myself a lot. Like, why are you waiting for someone else to do something about this? Um, so. Right. Yeah. That's a, yeah. But just trying to examine the trope, like it's real, you know, like it's not mm -hmm. just something that we base stories on. I mean, I love them. So I don't want it to be like, it's not, I don't want anything to be self-serious, you know, like this is fantasy. It should be fun and funny and all those things. But, um, you know, but there's also like a serious component to it. Like, what does it say about us exactly? So anyway, yeah. Um, did we want to, well, I think we're going to move to questions soon, but... Yeah, I was trying to... Sorry, anyway. No, no, you're fine. Um, I was trying to figure out the questions. Anyway, go on, sorry. Do you do you want to talk about some books that you recommend that you've been reading recently so that we can throw people at Copperfields? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've been just binging Holly Black like a maniac. I, I've been reading, like, I read The Cruel Prince a while ago, and now I'm almost done with the wicked king and i have um the queen of nothing like in, next in the pile and i yeah, also have so i've never still never read the coldest girl in cold town so that's like my, my next one. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited to read i've heard such good things about it and i'm just you know i'm super super excited to read 
all, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the Wicked King so much. It's such a good example of like paying off everything from the first book in just like such a beautiful way. I'm like, oh my God, how the hell did she do this? It's so good. No, she's great. How about you? What are you reading right now? Um, well, I've been having a hard time reading in quarantine, not going to lie. Um, but I just finished Blue Ticket by Sophie McIntosh. She wrote The Water Cure, which came out. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and I think Blue Ticket just came out on Tuesday. So oh, it was nice. excellent. Um, and then before that, I had finished How Much of These Hills is Gold by Si Pam Zhang. And that's like the Old West, but with Chinese Americans in it. So like I mean, there are actually more Chinese but, Americans in the Old West, but yeah. Yes, but not your typical Western story where it's just like a bunch of white cowboys running around. Right. Um, and it's no, a little bit like amazing. fantastical. Yeah, it's very good and beautifully written. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I love it. That sounds awesome. Oh, another recommendation, a book that I read a while ago, but it just finally got published, is The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea by Maggie Tokuda Hall which it just came out like a couple of weeks ago. I think it's like an indie, it's definitely an Indian next bestseller. It is such a freaking amazing book. It's like got pirates and mermaids and witches and right a either. stark doomed romance. And I'm sure Copperfield has it. It's such a freaking great book. Maggie Takuda Hall, um, who's helping to run the bookstore fundraisers with me. She's amazing. And I love that book so much. Um, but yeah, anyway. Cool. So do we want to take some questions? All right. How are we gonna do this? Do you okay. mind? Um, I'm just going to kind of be a floating head here, and we have so many questions. Yay. Uh, Yay. So let's start with one for both of you. How okay. do you decide when a character needs to die? Do you realize it when writing? Do you plan it ahead of time? And has a death you've written ever surprised you? Well, you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, usually I planned it. Um, no, all the time I plan it. Yeah. There are a couple characters I wanted to kill that I didn't um, in the Divergent series, like uh, Tobias's father, who's horrible, and he just wouldn't die. He was like a cockroach. I just couldn't make it feel right. Um, so I wanted, I wanted him to die, but it wouldn't work. Um, but most of the time, yeah, if a character is going to die, I've got a plan. Um, and as for who, um, well, there's a couple rules for me, which is that it has to make an emotional impact for a lot of the reasons that we've talked about, because I don't want any kind of like cheap deaths that you don't feel, because um, that feels like, I don't know, it feels like cheating. <laughs> like you, you want it to do something, that's the point. Um, and you want it to feel like the grief is earned. So that's important to me. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. Other than that, it sort of, uh, depends on their role in the story and, um, how that's going to work. I do kill off parents a lot, which I think is kind of a staple of YA, so it's not that surprising. Um, but, uh, that usually happens at the beginning. So. How about you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, whenever I kill off a character, I usually plan it way in advance. It's like probably the thing I, I like plan the most partly because it's like usually it's some kind of turning point usually it's something that you know i um i want it to have an impact like you said i want it to be like it's often a thing where like the stakes are being raised a little bit like i said before like it's like okay this this is obviously fucking seriously because this this person just died so this is not just this is something serious going on here um i try to make yeah i mean i actually try to use deaths pretty sparingly but make them like have an impact and you know in my ya that's coming out next year uh victory is greater than death which i think is available for pre-order already um yay anyway in that there are some deaths which you know i really tried super super hard to like like it's part of establishing the villain in a way if the villain doesn't kill anybody i feel like okay this villain is obviously not that bad if he's just wandering around making threats and never carrying through he's got to occasionally carry through on his threats or else you just stop taking him seriously. So that was part of the motivation for me. It was the most villainy villain I'd had in my fiction in a while. So I wanted to make sure that he actually got to kill people. But um, I just, yeah, I mean, in general, like I, I want the death to be meaningful and to, 
to be something that the characters have to sit with. And like in All the Birds in the Sky, there's this one character who I really love named Dorothea, who is like a witch who only can only tell lies. And she's, she, she does magic by making up weird stories that don't make any sense. And I really loved her as a character. I thought she was really fun. And spoiler alert, she gets killed off. And the way that she gets killed off is kind of partly the fault of one of the main characters. And I had to really think about how to do that and how to make it on the one hand, something that you really feel like, okay, this, this person really kind of crossed a line and should feel bad about this. But also on the other hand, it's not going to ruin this character that they were involved in killing this lovely old lady. Like we have to at least understand why it happened and kind of forgive them for it a little bit. And so it was tricky and I really wrestled with it a lot. Mm -hmm. Making that hard stuff understandable and sympathetic without making it seem like it's not a big deal is like a real balancing act, I think. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. So Courtney Johnson is wondering, how do you decide when your character will go through a growth moment? Do you let your character decide this as you write, or do you know which moments you want to use to push them forward as a person? Wow, this is deep. <laughs> Gotta think about this one for a second. I can go first. I mean, for me, you know, sometimes I have things where I'm like, okay, this is going to be a turning point in the character's story. This is the moment where they realize that that they're not in their old life anymore, or they're not like, this is the moment where I'm going to really have it sink in that, that something has changed or that they have grown or that they have, can't keep doing things the way they used to. And that definitely happens for me. But oftentimes, like I would say more often, what happens is I have a plot point that I'm like, okay, this is a plot point. This thing happens and this has to happen so that we can get to this plot point. And then I've written it and I'm like, oh, but for this character who was here for this plot point, who was participating in this plot point in some way, this is actually a huge freaking deal. And it's going to, it's not just going to move the plot forward. It's actually going to be, they had to do something really intense or they had to witness something really intense. And I have to deal with this. And oftentimes it's like the second go round, the second revision where I'm like, yeah, this character is not really, they're reacting in the moment, but they're not really feeling this, the fallout from this thing that happens. And in my YA, that definitely happens a bunch of times. There's like one or two moments where I was like writing, 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 writing. And I was like, oh, wait, but this should actually, this should mess the main character up. Like they should be messed up by this. And it should be something that they don't just like bounce back from. And, you know, that's one of my, one of my failure roads is that I write characters who just bounce back from stuff. And I just have to remind myself that people aren't really like that in real life. Yeah. Um, but anyway, what do you think? Oh, well, I'm thinking that I don't really plan character growth. I plan plot, sort of like what you were saying. So I often, this is why, like, I hold my outlines really loosely, because inevitably what happens is that you've built your plot, you go through it, and then you realize that the kind of emotional arc that you had planned in your mind no longer works. And you need to kind of redo whole sections of your book, or especially my endings, I end up just throwing them out. Because the thing that I thought the character would learn over the course of the book, um, kind of sort of nebulously in the corner of my mind, ends up not being the thing that they learned at all. And then after a rough draft, I figure out you know, what the book really is about. And in revisions, I have to make sure that the entire book reflects what I'd like figured out by the end. So I think when people think about writing, they almost think you have to like get it all together in your rough draft and then you just kind of like pick at your sentences for your next draft. That's not what happens to me. <laughs> um, I end up just gutting the entire thing and rewriting huge portions of it. Like the rough draft is like an outline basically um, by the time it's done. And that's kind of where the character growth takes uh, more refined shape and starts to make sense for me. The rough drafts is like a bunch of paper dolls doing all this stuff that I'm telling them to do and it doesn't make any sense and it's all terrible. <laughs> That's uh, such a good way of looking at it. Like the rough draft is basically just like an outline with like extra stuff. <laughs> That's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah. Oh, by the way, about killing people off. Like one thing that I was just thinking about is that, you know, I've done a little bit of work in television lately and, and hung out. I was in LA a lot for like, most of like the last half of 27, tw sorry, 2019, God, what are years? And, um, you know, basically from July to like f March. And like, you know, you when you're hanging out with Hollywood people, they'll always be like, yeah, you know, 
this character's great. We want to keep them around for a few seasons unless the actor starts to annoy us and then they're dead. <laughs> and it's like, right. I mean- You have to deal I with should, a real person, that. right? Um, I mean, yeah, it's, and, uh, people, I think it's a joke, but it's also a little bit real that like, you know, if the actor doesn't work out, you can just kill the character off. I probably shouldn't say that, but anyway. Well, no, it's like a, that's like the, the sitcom trope in a bunch of, like, a bunch yeah. of sitcoms is the whole soap opera thing where it's like, don't piss off the writers because they'll- Seriously. An elevator shaft or whatever. <laughs> you better say the line away, I wrote it or else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. Anything could happen. Anything can happen. You're, you're all dispensable. So the next question is actually from a um, budding writer in Indonesia, and it kind of follows along in what you were just speaking about. But how do you both develop your imagination uh, idea into a book? What's your process like? Can you tell us more about that? Ooh, I think I hear a cat. I'm very excited. <laughs> Um, <laughs> my cat's angry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. like, uh, I'll just imagine. I'll imagine this cat. Um, gosh, well, that's, I don't know if I have a set process. Every book is different, wildly different for me. But um, usually, like, I have a, I start with like kind of a concept or an I- idea. Um, but a concept or an idea is not a good book make. So then until I have kind of a character to put in that like to be the one to execute or explore that idea, then the book doesn't go. Um, And at that point, I start to build the world by throwing the character into it. So I'm not like one of those people who has like a bunch of documents planning out like how the plumbing works and what the currency is. Like, I don't do that. Um, And this is why I write, like I do really robust revisions because my world building tends to be a little thin on the rough draft, but that's because I'm kind of just like, hurling people into situations and seeing what's relevant like what's important about the world and how do I want to make it feel and you know what what do I need to know about it and what don't I need to know so that's kind of how things take shape for me what about what about you yeah I mean it's more or less the same I love like I often will have like a wacky idea that's like oh you know what if this happened or like I don't know what if there's a world where what is that zombies in space? Zombies in space, you know, zombies in space. I'll be like, okay, what if there's a world where like the amount of gravity that you get to have like around you depends on how much money you have and like rich people can afford more gravity than poor people. And so poor people are just kind of floating around and rich people are like on the ground and it's like this whole weird thing. And I'm like, weird, like ideas like that are fun, but that's not a story. What's a story is like the character and what they're personally dealing with in the context of that. And it took me a long time to really figure this out. I used to be just like, oh, but it's really cool because like the rich have more gravity than everybody else. And this is like, you know, I can, it's, it's a cool metaphor for inequality. And I can just like, you know, maybe there's somebody who's trying to steal some gravity or something. And like, they've got a big bag. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it's like, I don't know. It, it, for me, like finding like, what speaks to me about the idea is, is usually the hard part, like finding like, okay, so I've got like 20 really cool ideas, but you know, I start to work on all of them and like most of them are just kind of lifeless. They're not even going anywhere. They're just a cool idea. But the one that I really want to spend time on is the one that's actually kind of saying something to me personally. That's like, okay, this, this is an idea that I want to get into because it really gets at some stuff that like means something to me personally, or that like, I really am trying to work through this thing in my own head about you know just stuff that you know i've had to deal with in my life and so that's usually like those are the ideas that kind of stick and then just find once you find the thing that like is like meaningful to me or whatever once i find the thing that's meaningful to me just drilling down into that as much as i can and just making it as emotional as i can and that's really the thing is like what can you get emotional about like because most ideas are just cool ideas and most and most things that you can imagine are just like, oh, that's wacky. Yeah. But you know, yeah. I have a friend who said to me once that she always starts out a book thinking she's writing about one thing and then it turns out she's really writing about herself. <laughs> and I was like, yes, <laughs> that sounds familiar. Fair, um, fair. Endless self-exploration. But that's because that's what you connect to, right? You've only, you only live in this body, you only live in this brain. So you right. gotta find a way to relate stuff to you. Unfortunately, sure. that seems to be the way it works. 
Thank you. I just have to tell you, there are so many people that are thanking you and want to know so much more about your process and lots of aspiring writers on here. Aww. Uh, that's Madeline, so great. Yeah. Madeline is wondering, how do you guys get out from your comfort zone during writing? Oh, <laughs> or do you? I, have a, I, I don't think I have a comfort zone. I don't know. You, you go first. Um, well, I'm a very anxious person, so I'm a bit tentative. Actually, that's one of my main, I, I feel like this is going to be totally bewildering to people who read the books because I end up being quite in, like intense and kind of cruel at times to characters, but um, but I am like kind of uh, afraid of making decisions and of nailing myself into a corner kind of, and so um, I end up just like avoiding, like I, the, one of the drafts of one of my books, I don't remember which one, my editor was like, I feel like you're just avoiding having this character interact with any people. <laughs> I was like, yes, they have indeed been wandering around for 50 pages feeling bad. Um, so, so what I've ended up doing is like, whatever I can do to trick myself into believing that only I will ever have to read this work that I'm doing. And I can do the weirdest, craziest, most ridiculous thing there and no one gets to see it. So sometimes that means like I write in Scrivener. So I'll like open up Scrivener and I'm like, okay, this is the rough draft. And they're like, no, no, this can't be the rough draft. So I open up Word and I'm like, this will be the scratch document that I will later put into Scrivener. That will be the rough draft. And if it's really bad, then I open up WordPad and I'm like, see, this is not official at all. Um, so you know, just like anything I can do to trick myself into like, this is just for fun, don't worry about it, is how I kind of get out of my comfort zone because in order to get out of my comfort zone, I have to feel safe to take risks. That's how I do it. Yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of like what my comfort zone as a writer, like I think specifically for me as a writer, like my comfort zone was always like kind of funny, quirky, whimsical, silly, zaniness. And I can, I can, bang out like a few pages of quirky whimsical silliness on a good day without you know breaking too much of a sweat because I just get like I, I kind of have that in my head now I I grew up watching a lot of Monty Python and reading like the Phantom Toll Booth and like Daniel Pinkwater and like all these other things and so I just like that's kind of hardwired into my brain this kind of like zany wacky weird silliness and you know if you read uh, and All the Birds of the Sky has a lot of that. And actually part of the revision process for All the Birds of the Sky was every single round of revisions, I just took out more humor, took out more funny bits until what was left was the funny bits that supported the characters. And I sort of felt like, you know, to some extent I use humor as like a way to avoid, like most people, I use humor as a way to avoid dealing with stuff and as a way to just be like, oh yeah, well just look at all this funny stuff and don't even think about like, you know, all the unpleasant, weird, terrible things that are happening. And so for the city in the middle of the night, I made a kind of a conscious decision that I was going to try to drastically reduce the amount of humor in that book and really make it a much more serious kind of like, kind of intense introspective book that really focused on character and emotion and didn't use humor as a way to kind of get around having to do that because I felt like maybe my writing would improve if I didn't have humor to lean on so much. And so the city of the middle of the night still has some funny bits. There's like a page of like, just like poop jokes, but um, it's not as funny as my other books. Cut it by design because I was trying to force myself out of my comfort zone as a writer. I was trying to force myself to do something that didn't come naturally to me because I feel like that's maybe how you improve. At least I hope. I'm gonna yeah, plug my computer know. in. Sorry, go on. This is very funny to hear because with Chosen Ones, I think I did the exact opposite because humor does not come naturally to me. And I was like, this book's going to be funny. And it's it's not like what you would describe as a funny book, but it's certainly the funniest book that I've written. Um, and telling myself that's what it had to be was a nice way of like forcing some growth. So I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, we should just like meld our brains together and we'll just... <laughs> <laughs> be the perfect balance <laughs> have one globby like super brain that's just like yeah sounds good mm. thanks sounds awesome so we need another... an exoskeleton though anyway sorry <laughs> another question from kaylee is do either of you ever cry your eyes out when writing a death scene in spite of trying to prepare yourselves for it 
she actually cried a lot when reading the Divergent series and Chosen Ones, and she thanks you. <laughs> she thanks you. Oh, that's nice. But not not everyone thanks me for the crying that they did, so I appreciate it. Um, do, uh, yeah. Uh, hmm. So I don't cry while writing, period, um, ever. But I do do it later. I think I'm in denial. So like, I remember when I wrote certain significant deaths in the Divergent series being like, well, I don't know if this is final yet. So let me just try it on for size and see if it works. So when I was writing it, I wasn't sad. But then like, you know, when I got further in the process and I realized, oh, I'm going to keep it. Like, this is, this is how it goes. Then I'll get upset about it. So I'm like really delayed in my like emotional reactions to things. I'm, I mean, that's how I am in life too. It just takes me like um, in interpersonal interactions when someone is like l lightly insulting me, I always realize it about six hours later. So <laughs> this is far from the course. <laughs> yeah. Man. Yeah, I don't cry while writing death scenes, I guess. I mean, you know, I don't, I think that the main thing that I like get kind of teary while writing is is really emotional scenes where people are kind of being really vulnerable and really kind of like getting hurt like emotionally or kind of dealing with really intense stuff that's where i get like really kind of like you know and you know i don't i don't cry that often while writing i do occasionally while rereading something really intense that i wrote i will get kind of teary but it's not it's not usually the death scenes i don't think i've ever I don't think I've ever written a death scene that was written to be like a cry death scene. I usually, when I kill characters off, it's usually like they're dead. And then the aftermath is the sad part. And like, it's just like, oh yeah, their brains are all over the floor. And we're going to feel something about that like five pages from now, maybe. Yeah, I would say I get more emotional during the aftermath, just like seeing characters in pain is a lot harder for me than losing them because I've usually planned that in advance and I, I feel very sure that it's good for the story and so I don't like agonize over it. But um, seeing kind of the impact of it is like, ooh, <laughs> that's tough, man. Hmm. All right, Jamie. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so kind of just to, I know we're getting close to the time here and um, you know, I don't wanna keep you guys too long, but lots of people are wondering, are there good writing organizations for aspiring writers that you would recommend? And do you ever put yourself through writing exercises to push through a block? If so, what types of things do you use? Hmm, well, do you have writer Wow. I mean, I've heard good things about Codex. I've heard Codex is really good. Um, I don't actually know. I mean, I think my advice for people who are trying to get into writing is always, you know, go to some conventions. Obviously, that's not a thing right now, but go to conventions. Try to do some, like, even if it's just, like, a one-day writing workshop, join a writer, join, like, a writing group. Like, there's a lot of online writing groups that you can join but also there might be one in your area. And again, that's not gonna be really possible for a lot of people right now, but in general, like my main advice to people who are starting out writing is to try to find community wherever you can. And that includes like going to open mics and reading your work aloud to people and like, you know, listening to other people read their work. And like, I get so much out of, even now I get so much out of reading my work aloud to people because I just, just see how it's landing or what's working or what's not working. And I hate it. You know, Oh, I find it really useful. It's just like a good oh, diagnosis. it's so useful. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, and I just, I think, you know, find find whatever groups you can join. If you could do something like Clarion or Clarion West or Odyssey or Viable Paradise, those are all really great. Um, but, you know, take writing classes. I don't know. Stuff yeah. like that. In terms of like, I've never, I haven't done any writing exercises in a long time, uh, to be honest. When I feel like I'm not getting somewhere with something, I just kind of usually step back and try to figure out what's not working and maybe put it away for a while and just take a walk or, you know, read something or watch TV. But I, I don't do writing exercises to get past blocks. Yeah, I, I agree with you about community for sure. I think the, well, I participated on Absolute Right with a W, which I don't think it's like as robustly like bustling as it used to be. 
Um, but that's where I made a lot of friends who, you know, we would trade manuscripts and critique each other. And that was really helpful. Um, and I also went to some conferences and that's where I found my agent at the Midwest Writers Workshop in Muncie, Indiana, which is actually a great, uh, a great writers conference um, that I recommend. But, and I also went to the Society of Children's Book, Children's Books Writers Institute, <laughs> SCBWI is what it is. I went to their conference too, to kind of make friends and meet people. Um, and so those were things I did, but most of my connections happened on the internet, which I think is scary to people because they think like, oh, if I share my writing, someone's going to steal it. And the thing is like these relationships don't just like, you don't just send someone a DM on Twitter, like, will you read my novel? Like without knowing them, you get to know each other and then, you know, you develop the relationship and then you maybe critique each other's work. So it's not like you have to just trust this total stranger. <laughs> um, and, uh, as far as writing exercises, I did a lot in college because I studied creative writing there, but mostly I do little exercises, but not like standard ones. I'll just be like, well, maybe I need to write this in a different tense from a different point of view. Maybe I need to start the scene in the middle. Maybe I need to write the end first. Maybe I, you know, so I'll do that kind of thing, but I don't do like official kind of like exercises, but I think it's helpful to know like different ways that you can conceive of writing something um, which exercises can certainly teach you to, like how to kind of approach things from a bunch of different angles and whatever way that you can learn how to do that is helpful. That's lovely advice. I appreciate it. Okay, now I swear it's the last question. So what's next for you both? Oh, a good question. Yeah, yeah. What, what can readers and, and fans be on the lookout for? Well, Charlie, I think you have a lot more things going on than I do, <laughs> so why don't you go? Well, I don't know. Okay, well, I'll go first. Uh, so I'm doing this writing advice column for Tor.com. If you just type tor.com into your browser, it should be one of the first things you see on that site. It's called Never Say You Can't Survive, and that's coming out every single week on, I think, Tuesdays at, like, noon Eastern time. So, you know, I'm working on that right now. Um, I have a young adult trilogy. Ah! It's so scary. I'm so intimidated. Um, <laughs> so intimidated. God, I have a young adult trilogy. The first book comes out in April. It's called Victories Greater Than Death. It just went up for pre-order like a week or two ago. And so, you know, that's the second, the first book is done. The second book is almost done. The third book is a bunch of like post-it notes somewhere. And I mean, I know what the big things that happen in the third book, but everything else is kind of like it. But uh, so the second book I'm just revising right now and it's, God, I think this, the second book is gonna end up being under a hundred thousand words, but I think I wrote like 400,000 words of it. Oh just try to figure stuff out. Cause I was like, oh God, I don't know what this is. So I'm just gonna write. I just wrote, this is me writing that book. I just wrote like a million scenes like to try to figure out. What. The keyboard. Yeah. Pretty much, that was exactly right. Veronica, what are you working on? What's in, what's in your um, pipeline? <laughs> What am I doing? I am in like a fun period right now because um, the next thing I technically have to work on is the sequel to Chosen Ones, but um, because the book just came out, I am like, oh, exciting. It should just be two, um, so this will be like the end, but uh, I'm gonna take a little break before I work on that just because, uh, you know, I just got out of the first one, so I need a little like brain time. But I am working on some fun stuff and um, I don't want to be coy about it. It's not, it's not divergent related. This is the thing I feel like I need to declare to people. But, but if you stay tuned and pay attention to my newsletter, the subscription link to which is on my website at veronicarothbooks.com, you may see fun stuff there eventually when I get it together. So um, that's going to be something fun. Well, thank you both. And for all of you who are looking to read Chosen Ones, I just shared a link in the chats. Uh, where you can purchase your own copy. And it's amazing how many of you have already read it. <laughs> it's just I know, lovely. I'm so excited. Um, I know, I'm so excited. Yeah. I love that uh, you, Who so would have thought it came out? <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for taking the time out. And there are so many thank yous coming in. I could have just kept you all night, but I'm mm. trying to be mindful of your time. And I appreciate everyone who tuned in and uh, hope you all have a really nice evening. Yay, thank Bye, you. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.